Realm presents Bullet Catcher, Season 3, Episode 13. The Lovers It's the middle of the morning and everyone is well past needing sleep. We take it in shifts watching Cass. I volunteer to go first. There's no way I'm sleeping anyway. I sit in a chair beside the bed. Lena hands me the creature. The weight fills my arms with warmth. The creature looks up at me with its big, dark eyes, looking right into my soul, to the pain of me. And then it smiles. I start to cry. I hold the creature in my arms as it falls asleep. This little being, so overflowing with life that it's almost as if it lends me some of its own. Feeling its warmth, hearing its quiet breathing, I feel my heart unclenching. Nico wakes a few hours later and drags a chair over to sit beside me. Anything? She's not dead yet. I suppose that's not nothing. We sit in silence for a few beats. Then he says, You should get some sleep. Not happening. No, I suppose not. Then, then what? I know what he's going to say before he says it. We can't afford to sit here and do nothing. I'm not doing nothing. I'm watching Cass. You heard the doc. I hate to say it, then don't. He clears his throat. I hate to say it, Emma, but Cass isn't our biggest priority right now. We need to find Pass and Ravia and get the hell back to Watertown. Go then. Emma, if Raina were lying here, would you go? Yes. He chokes at the very thought of it. If it meant staying by Rainer's bedside, or potentially saving an entire town, then yes, I would go. I don't believe you. Across the room, Daniel and Lena rise groggily from their cots, shaking the ache from their tired bodies. Then don't, says Nico, standing. I'm going to help Daniel and Lena find Paz and Ravia. I hope you'll be ready to go when the time comes. I pretend not to hear him. Daniel and Lena take turns at the wash basin, sharing the water, splashing their faces, and brushing their teeth. Nico crosses the room to the door. He stops with his hand on the latch. He turns and looks at me. Emma, I've done enough bad in my life to know that the pain of one person doesn't amount to anything compared to the suffering of two, or ten, or an entire people. If Cass hasn't woken by the time we leave... And if she dies without you ever telling her whatever you gotta tell her, it might hurt for the rest of your life. But if that pain buys the life of everyone in Watertown, how can you not make the bargain? He opens the door and steps out of the room. Daniel follows him out. Lena lingers. I stare at her sharply, my vision blurred by tears, hoping to chase her from the room. But she doesn't budge. She comes over and sits at the foot of Cass's bed and puts her hand on mine. If Nico's right, if you have something you need to say to Cass, then now's the time to say it. She looks out the window at the bright day leaking through the half-closed shutters. Every night we lay our head down to sleep, knowing that the sun will rise the next morning. But truth is, it doesn't. Not for all of us. One day you might close your eyes and never open them again. There ain't no promises in this life, not even the sunrise. So, whatever you have to say, say it. And she too rises and follows the others out the door. I lay the creature on Lena's bedroll, fluffing up the rug to make a little basket so it won't roll away in its sleep. I splash water on my face. I change my clothes, comb the blood out of my hair hold a mirror up to Cass's mouth, watch it fog. I clean the dirt and blood from under her fingernails. I brush the hair out of her eyes. I run a cool rag over her cheeks and forehead, her arms and legs. She doesn't wake. And I can't think of one thing to say to her to sum up how I feel. So I just hold her hand in mine and bow my head, touching her gnarled knuckles to my forehead. Don't die, Cass. Please don't die. They return after dark. The three of them are accompanied by an old woman, tall.
tall with olive skin and raven black hair. She wears a leather vest and silver rings on each finger, skulls and crosses like symbols on a map. She sticks out her hand and says in a scratchy, serious voice, You must be Emma. I'm Ravia. Thank goodness you're here. We sit down at the small table in the corner of the room. Ravia reaches into her bag and produces a bottle of snake bite, four glasses that she pinches together with her fingers, and a large roll of paper. She unfurls the paper, revealing a crudely drawn layout of Las Almas. She's marked the inn, the sheriff's office, the jail, and the roads leading out of town. She scatters the glasses around and tips snakebite into each. They took past three days ago. She's scheduled to hang at sundown tomorrow. What's she guilty of? Guilty? Ravia looks at me like I just said something incredibly stupid. She's guilty of living while being a bullet catcher. That's what she's guilty of. And hell, add to it that she was hopeful that enough time had passed since the war that she could stop hiding who she is. Problem is, people got a long memory. Longer memories than they have since anyway. You got kids who don't even remember their grandpappy or grandma who fought and died in the war, but they're sure as hell ready to kill for them. Never mind that they have no idea what the war was about, or why it started, or how it ended. All they have are grudges and factions, fermenting into hatred and idiocy. She stands up sharply, toppling her chair to the floor. Cool down, Ravia. She didn't mean anything by it, says Daniel. The creature stares at Ravia with big, curious eyes. Who is this person? Why are they so angry their eyes begin to water? Ravia stares back at the creature, and the anger drains out of her. She picks up her chair, sets it back up, and slumps down, runs her fingers through her hair. You should know, I ain't sorry for being angry. Sometimes when they've taken everything else, anger's all you got left. But I am sorry for losing it in front of the kid. It's seen worse. I'm sorry for presuming. She nods. All right, then, we're both sorry. She throws back her glass and pours herself another. Like I was saying, they've scheduled pass to hang at sundown. There should be a crowd, a big crowd, to hide in. Once they bring pass to the gallows, it shouldn't be too hard springing her. But we're going to need horses ready to go. We won't want to stick around after the firefight. We have a wagon. I'm thinking about Cass. How best to get her back to Watertown in her condition? Too slow. When I say we'll need to go... I mean, they'll be chasing us as far as their horses will carry them. If we try to beat it in a wagon, they'll be on us before we get out of the city limits. No, it'll have to be horses. We can't leave Cass, and she's in no condition to ride, even if we strap her down. All eyes turn to Cass, looking so small in the bed, like a flower left out in the sun to dry. I'll stay with her, Daniel says. As soon as she's able, we'll catch you up. It should be me. You know it can't be, Nico says quietly. She'll be okay, Daniel says. I promise. Ravia can't sleep. She stares out the window down at the plaza, where tomorrow the gallows will be erected. Cass hasn't so much as stirred, but she's still breathing, so that's something. Everyone else sleeps. Ravia flicks the nub of her cigarette out the window and immediately sticks another one between her lips and lights it up. How'd you meet? You and Pass, I mean. She startles like she'd forgotten I was there and takes a long drag on her cigarette to calm herself. The war, she says. We all met in the war. A thing like that has a tendency to bring folks together as long as they don't get themselves killed before the end. If you couldn't tell, I have a tendency to fly off the handle. Turns a lot of people off, makes people steer clear. That's a good thing when you're trying to make it on your own. Sometimes it don't matter how tough you are. Sometimes there's just more of them than there is of you, so having a reputation as being a bit of a hothead can be like a suit of armor. The trade-off is that it can get awful lonely. And then it just makes you angrier, because you know there's more to you than just the fighting and the yelling. 
but you're too set in your ways or too chicken shit to do anything about it. Then someone like Paz comes along, and she ain't afraid of you. It's like she has this power to see right through you, and amazingly, against all reckoning, she sees you for who you are. Sometimes you don't realize you were invisible until someone sees you for the first time. It's an amazing thing, being seen. She falls silent. Maybe it's just that she's been keeping all this in, that when I asked it all came spilling out, and now she's a little embarrassed for all the talking. Her cheeks and collar burn a little red. She stamps out the cigarette on the windowsill. I'm going to take a walk, get some air. Ravia steps her way across the sleeping bodies on her way to the door. The flickering lamp in the hall lights the edges of the room as she opens the door and slips outside. I watch her exit the building and cross the plaza, her hands in her pockets and her eyes on her boots. The creature stares out the window with me, following Ravia across the plaza until she disappears down the street. I start awake. The sun shines warmly on my face. I blink away stars. My body aches from falling asleep in the chair. Nico sits at the table, cradling the creature in his arms, shoveling mashed vegetables into its mouth with some amount of success. There's mashed carrots and potato on the table and all down the front of the creature's shirt. Cass breathes evenly in bed. Everyone else is gone. They're already down in the square, Nico says, pointing to the window with a spoon. I rise and look down at the plaza, where a crowd has already begun to form. Judging by the sun, it's not even noon, but people have arrived early to stake out a good spot to watch the hanging. Len has gone to get the horses and sell the wagon. Daniel's getting supplies to hole up with Cass. Figures he ought to lie low after we spring pass, whether he's part of it or not. You was trying to sort out a place a little farther out of the way where Daniel can watch over Cass. And Ravi is getting a good vantage on the gallows and trying to keep herself out of trouble. Once Daniel gets back, we're supposed to meet her down there. I watch the people moving about below, thinking about Cass. Listen, if you need a moment alone with Cass, I can take the kid. How does he do that? Read my mind. I take a long look at Cass, then turn to Nico and say, I'll tell her when I see her again. The setting sun sits behind the gallows, casting the hastily knocked-together structure in a black silhouette. Families have spread picnic blankets out in the square, and parents hold up children on their shoulder to better see the platform. Kids no older than ten lug around canvas bags packed with popsicles, selling them for a few coins, leaving a trail of melted water behind them. Up near the platform, I stand waiting for the gunslingers to appear with pas in tow. Ravia chain smokes. Nico waits on the roof of the inn with his rifle, and Lena waits with the horses in a disused barn we found a few streets off the plaza. She's supposed to come galloping in when she hears the commotion. The crowd, alive with laughter and conversation, suddenly hushes. A posse of gunslingers emerges from the jailhouse, leading a smallish figure with a black hood over her head. Beside me, Ravia tenses, as though fighting every instinct she has to rush the gunslingers and take them on single-handed. As the procession nears the gallows, the crowd starts to boo. The man leading the somber group is a big gunslinger with a patch beard, piercing blue eyes, and a black derby hat too small for his head. He draws his pistol and fires it in the air, and the crowd stops throwing things. They lead Paz up the creaky steps to the top of the platform. They pull the rope over her head and cinch it around her neck. She doesn't struggle, doesn't make a sound, even when one of them leans close to the bag and asks if she has any last words. She doesn't so much as shake her head in reply, as if she won't even dignify his question with a response. Or maybe she just knows whatever she would say wouldn't amount to anything like her last words. The sheriff steps to the front of the stage, unrolls a warrant, and begins to read. But no sooner does he start than the crowd begins to boo and shout and throw things again. They've come for blood, and they won't be satisfied until they get it. The sheriff draws his gun again and fires it into the air, but this time it does nothing to quiet the crowd. He lets off a couple more shots before giving up, crumpling the warrant and dropping it on the stage. He extends his arms to the crowd and yells at the top of his lungs, 
Let's kill the bullet catcher! The crowd erupts in cheers. Ravia clenches her fists and leans close to me to be heard. Until a few days ago, we counted some of these people as friends. She spits in disgust. The sheriff turns and drops his arms. The executioner pulls a lever and the trapdoor beneath Pasa's feet drops open. A loud boom erupts from the rooftop of the inn. For an instant, the rope grows taut and then snaps. Pass drops through the trapdoor and lands heavily on the stone floor beneath the gallows. Ravia ducks beneath the platform to retrieve her, while I climb up onto the gallows to draw away the gunslinger's attention. Lena comes charging through from the other side of the plaza, leading a herd of saddled and ready horses behind her. Who the hell are you? says the sheriff to me, drawing his gun. I grab him by the wrist and force the gun back in the holster. For a big man, he doesn't have much muscle. My name is Immaculata Moreno. Don't forget it. I knee him between the legs and push him backward into the open trap door. The executioner draws his gun and levels it at me. Another boom rings out from the rooftop, and the gun goes flying out of his hand, sparks and blood splashing across the platform. Here comes Lena with the horses, scattering picnickers in her wake. I charge the last gunslinger, lowering my shoulder into his stomach and toppling him off the platform, and then with that same momentum, leap into the saddle of my waiting horse. Ravia emerges from beneath the gallows with Paz unhooded in her arms. It looks like she hurt her leg in the fall. Ravia lifts her up into the saddle before mounting her own horse. Nico catapults himself off the roof, hits the slanted roof below, and slides down into the saddle of his horse below. Lena kicks her horse and leads the way out of the plaza, down the dusty street, and out of town. I take one last glance over my shoulder at the end window, through which I know Daniel is watching everything, and behind him, Cass, fighting her own battle. I know I'll see her again. I can't afford to think any differently. If I let myself think any differently, I'll pull on these reins and ride this horse right back into Las Almas. The gunslingers follow us for a good 50 miles out of town, but their horses give up before ours, and finally, when we look over our shoulders, there's no one following us. The creature yawns, its whole face turning into the shape of an O. That's right. I think we made it. It's well past midnight when we finally feel safe enough to stop and camp for the night. We find an abandoned way station not far off the main road. These old outposts used to serve as mail depots for riders delivering messages from town to town, and sometimes they had dried fruit and jerky sellers and someone selling moonshine. This one looks like it hasn't seen a living soul in decades. Inside the cramped one-room building stands a well. Nico pushes off the cover and lowers the old bucket to the bottom, but pulls up nothing but sand. There's an old counter with shelves behind it, containing the shattered remnants of glass bottles. Bullet casings litter the floor. Wind rushes through the broken slats in the walls. For a few minutes, we kick through the old ruined items inside the shack, before filing outside to set up a fire and get some rest. Off by themselves on one side of the fire, Pass leans against Ravia. Pass hasn't said anything since Las Almas. She looks tired. Her face is bruised and swollen. They worked her over pretty good. Ravia is quiet for the first time since I met her. She whispers things into Pasa's ear, and then Pas shifts and looks up at Ravia to kiss her, before settling back against her. Len is fast asleep. Nico comes over and sits beside me. He picks at the last of the white meat inside the jacket of a roasted potato, before tossing the rest of it into the fire. Thinking about Cass? He asks. I'm thinking how the hell we're going to save Watertown without her. Look at us. We're not exactly the cavalry. I think Lobo would have some choice words for you about judging people. What did he always used to say? Strength comes from inside, not from your muscles or the gun in your hand. I smile at the familiar words. He told you that too? He nods. I should have listened. The creature sleeps soundly in my arms. I run my fingers through its dark curls. Thought any more on a name? I'll let you know when I tell the father. God, I hope he hasn't gotten himself killed. He'll be okay. So will Rainer and Cass. You'll see. We're all going to make it out of this somehow. How do you know? 
It's like you said. I have to believe, or else maybe I'll just lie down and give up right here. I stay up after Nico turns in, poking the fire and talking to the creature. Because what if I die tomorrow and I haven't told it anything worth remembering? Finally, I douse the fire, pick up my bedroll, and head into the abandoned shack. Sweeping away the bullet shells and glass and broken ceramic, I make our bed and lay the creature down, sliding in beside it. I touch my forehead to the creature's forehead, close my eyes, and think very hard. If you remember one thing, remember that you are loved. And when I open my eyes, I convince myself by the look on its sleeping face, the drool dribbling down its chin, that the creature has heard me and understood. I rest my head on the ground. From somewhere deep below, I hear water roiling and churning, stirred by the moon overhead and the gentle turning of the earth. A lifeblood running through the deep veins of the planet, rushing toward Watertown, calling me home. You're listening to Bullet Catcher Season 3 by Joaquin Lowe. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. Bullet Catcher is written by Joaquin Lowe, produced by Marco Palmieri, and executive produced by Molly Barton. Performed by Inez del Castillo. Audio produced, directed, and designed by Amanda Rose Smith. Additional editing by Corey Barton. Original theme composed by Hashem Asadolahi, with performances by Justin Morell and Josh Deutsch. Cover art by Christine Barcelona. Christine Barcelona.